about uh, chapter six, long-term memory. Uh, let's see how we can get through this without me complaining. <laughs> uh, good luck. Okay. Uh, long-term memory. Lots of arguments. Let's see what they are. Long-term memory is a mechanism which enables us to store information and experiences in a lasting fashion for possible retrieval at some point in the future. This ability to create and retrieve memories is fundamental to all aspects of cognition, and it is crucial to our ability to function properly as human beings. Our memories allow us to store information about the world so that we can understand and deal with future situations on the basis of past experience. The processes of thinking and problem solving also rely heavily on the use of previous experience and memory also makes it possible for us to acquire language and to communicate with others. Memory also plays a very basic part in the process of perception, since we can only make sense of our perceptual input by making reference to our store of previous experiences. Even our social interactions with others are dependent upon what we remember. It can be said that our very identity relies on an intact memory and the ability to remember who we are and the things that we have done. Almost everything we ever do depends on our ability to remember the past. The memory process can be divided into three main stages. The input stage, the storage stage, and the output stage. The input stage is where newly per perceived information is being learned or encoded into memory. The storage stage is where the information is held in preparation for some future occasion. And the output stage is where the information is retrieved from, from storage. A memory trace will only be retrievable if all three of these stages are successfully completed. This means that when we find we are unable to recall some item, the cause could be either a failure at the input stage, uh, the learning failure, a failure at the output stage, the retrieval failure, or a failure of the storage mechanism. In practice, storage failures uh, probably do not occur unless there is damage to the brain, so it is probable that most forgetting is caused by either learning failure or retrieval failure. And the reason I have the silo is because it is where you store grain. And there you go, that's a storage failure. The scientific study of memory began with the work of Hermann Ebbinghaus in 1885, whose methods were, were to have a huge influence on memory research for many years. Using himself as an experimental subject, Ebbinghaus carried out a number of classic experiments in which he attempted to measure memory uh, performance uh, in a scientific and quantified manner, making an effort to, to eliminate all unwanted variables from his experimental design. Of course, it was nearly impossible. So what he did, he came up with nonsense syllables that he had to memorize. But there's a problem with that as well. Memories tend to dissipate over a period of time, and Ebbinghaus suggested two main theories to explain why this might occur. One is decay. Memories fade away with the passage of time, regardless of other input. And the other is interference. Memories are actively disrupted by the influence of some other uh, input. So we have decay, and we have interference. <laughs> uh, Ebbinghaus was able to demonstrate experimentally that interference did indeed have a significant effect on memory. He showed that memory scores for the learning of one list were considerably reduced by the subsequent learning of a second list, a phenomenon known as retroactive interference. Another experiment showed that the memory for a list was also subject to interference from a previously learned list, a phenomenon known as proactive interference. Interference could be caused by any additional input occurring either before or after the target list. Producing evidence for the occurrence of spontaneous decay has proved to be rather problematic. 
because it is difficult to separate its effects from those of other forms of forgetting, including interference, which also take place with the passage of time. Thorndike in 1914 suggested that decay only affects memory traces which remain unretrieved for a long period, an idea known as the decay with disuse theory. This theory was later updated by Bjork and Bjork in 1992, who suggested that access to a memory trace is strengthened by frequent retrieval, whereas unretrieved memories become more inaccessible as time passes. And this is decay uh, with disuse. That's why I have this picture. <laughs> Bartlett, in 1932, delved into the memory by choosing stories which were unusual, uh, starting with a Native American folk tale called The War of the Ghosts. This story is rather strange to the average person from a Western cultural background because it involves ghosts and magical spells. Bartlett found that his participants usually recalled a changed and distorted version of the story. And here's the story. One night, two young men from Egulac were down to the river, went down to the river to hunt seals, and while they were in, uh, they, while they were, and while they were, it became foggy and calm. Then they heard war cries, and they thought, maybe this is a war party. They escaped to the shore and hid behind a log. Now canoes came up, and they heard the noise of paddles and, and saw one canoe coming up to them. There were five men in the canoe, and they said, What do you think? We wish to take you along. We, will, we are going up, river, up the river to make war on the people. One of the young men said, I have no arrows. Arrows are in the canoe, they said. I will not go along. I might be killed. My relatives do not know where I have gone, but you, he said, turning to the other, may go with them. So one of the young men went, but the other returned home, and the warriors went on uh, up the river to a town on the other side of Kalama. The people came down to the water and began to fight, and many were killed. But presently one of the young men heard one of the warriors say, Quick, let us go home. The Indian has been hit. Now he thought, oh, they are ghosts. He did not feel sick, but he had been shot. So the canoes went back to Agulac, and the young man went back to his house and made a fire. And he told everybody and said, behold, I accompanied the ghosts, and we went, and we went to fight. Many of our fellows were killed, and many of those that attacked us were killed. They said I was hit, but I did not feel uh, sick. He told it all, and then he became, became quiet. When the sun rose, he fell down. Something black came out of his mouth. His face beca became contorted. The people jumped up and cried, he was dead. That's the story. The changes were not random. They were systematically directed towards the creation of a more rational and straightforward story. Bartlett concluded that participants tended to rationalize the story to make it fit with their expectations based on their own past experience and knowledge of the world. The story recalled by Bartlett's British subjects were, was a more conventional account of an expedition which was relatively free from ghostly or magical interventions. Some of the more strange and unfamiliar parts of the story tended to be left out altogether, whilst, while other Others uh, would be distorted and changed to fit in with a more conventional and British view of the world. Bartlett explained these findings in terms of his schema theory, which proposes that we perceive and encode information into our memories in terms of our past experience. Schemas are the mental representations that we have built up from all that we have experienced in the past. The Bartlett and Bartlett argued that we compare any new perceptual input with our past schemas in an effort to find something meaningful and familiar. Any input which does not match up with the existing schemas will either be distorted to make it match the schemas, or else it will not be retained at all. Distortion of eyewitness testimony by pre-existing schemas has been confirmed by many subsequent studies. 
Tukey and uh, Brewer in 2003 showed that eyewitnesses to a crime were able to provide far more accurate information about events that were consistent with their existing schemas, such as a robbery involving masked criminals carrying guns and escaping in a getaway car. However, they produced distorted and inaccurate memories for aspects of the crime which were inconsistent with their previous experience. Many other studies have confirmed that eyewitness uh, testimony for a crime or incident can be distorted, not only by previous knowledge, but also by subsequent events. A mnemonic is a technique or strategy used to improve the memorability of uh, items, such as by adding meaningful associations. Mnemonics usually work by adding a meaning to material which is otherwise fairly meaningless and their effectiveness provides further evidence that people are much better at memorizing meaningful information which they are able to relate to their previous knowledge. Craig and Lockhart in 1972 proposed a theory uh, referred to as the levels of processing theory. It suggests that the processing of new perceptual input involves the extraction of information at a series of levels of increasing depth of analysis with more uh, with more information being extracted at each level. This is Crake, uh, Angus Crake. I didn't couldn't find a picture of Lockhart. One crucial aspect of the LOP theory is that it emphasizes the need to carry out extensive processing of incoming information in order to store it in the long-term memory. Crake and Lockhart argued that this is not enough and that long-term storage can only be achieved by active processing of the input. Craig and Lockhart suggested that the memory trace is essentially a byproduct of perceptual processing. Elaborative encoding refers to the formation of associative connections with other memory traces, and this occurs most effectively where meaningful associations can be made. Craig and Tolving in 1975 confirmed that semantic elaboration does indeed create a stronger and more lasting trace. Elaborative encoding creates a large number of associative links with uh, other items in the, the uh, memory store so that the new trace becomes incorporated into an extensive network of interconnected memory traces. Since each of these associative links can serve as a potential retrieval route, the trace will be easier to retrieve if there are many possible links leading back to it. There are two main ways of testing retrieval, recall, recall and recognition. In the recognition test, the original test material is presented again at the retrieval stage, whereas in a recall test it is not. This is like a, a multiple, multiple choice question. The answer is there, and it's, and it's in the retrieval st stage. So that's a recognition test, is a, is a multiple choice. There are two different types of recall test. In a test of cued recall, the participant is provided with retrieval cues, which help to remind them of the target items. In a test of spontaneous recall, no cues are presented, so the participant is required to generate the target items without any assistance. Retrieval uh, tests usually involve one of the following three procedures. Spontaneous recall requires the generation of items from memory without any help. Cued recall or retrieval cues are provided as a reminder of the items to be recalled. And recognition, the original test items are presented again at the retrieval stage. Tolving argued that memory retrieval is largely cue dependent. Whether we can retrieve a memory or not will depend on the presence of a suitable retrieval cues, which act as reminders and help to reactivate the original memory trace. There is a considerable body of evidence confirming that retrieval success is closely related to the number and quality of retrieval cues available. And this is a joke. This is Tolving, of course. He's Finnish, I believe. And that's Tolving in the cartoon. 
Tolving in 1972 argued that the retrieval of an item from memory depends on the presence of retrieval cues that match up with the specific aspects of the stored memory trace. Tolving called the encoding, this the encoding uh, specificity principle, or ESP. Retrieval cues will only be successful if they contain some of the same specific information which was encoded with the original input. Tolving suggested that the chance of retrieving a memory trace depends on the amount of feature overlap between input and retrieval information, which is the extent to which features of the trace stored at input, uh, at input match those, unav those available at retrieval. Bleh. Transfer appropriate processing refers to the finding that the the most effective type of input processing will be whatever offers the closest match with the available retrieval cues. Transfer appropriate processing has been demonstrated in a number of studies which show that acoustic retrieval cues are most effective when input processing was also acoustic and semantic retrieval cues work best when the input processing was also semantic. You may have noticed that when you revisit a place where you spent part of your earlier life, old memories from that period tend to come flooding back, cued by the side of a street or a building that you have not seen for many years. Sometimes a particular piece of music may bring back old memories. A smell or a taste can help uh, to revive memories from the past. These are all examples of context-dependent memory, and they rely on revisiting or reinstating an earlier context, which then serves as a retrieval cue. Chu and Downs in 2000 found that odors could act as strong cues to the re retrieval of events from early life, and finding which has been uh, a finding which has been referred to as the Proust phenomenon as it parallels the observations of Marcel Proust about the childhood memories brought back by the smell of a madeleine cake. However, a more recent study has shown that although odors can certainly evoke memories from the past, they are no more effective than visual stimuli. Perhaps the most valuable concept con contributed by Proust was the observation that memory retrieval can often be involuntary, requiring no effort or intention to retrieve the memories. And this is the Proustian effect. Uh, and suddenly the memory revealed itself. The taste was that of the little piece of Madeleine, which on Sunday mornings at Cambrai, my Aunt Leonie uh, used to give me, dipping it first in her own cup of tea or tisane, whatever tisane is. State-dependent memory has been reported with depression. Bauer et al. in 1978 found that the retrieval of a word list was slightly better if the participant was again in the same depressed mood at retrieval as they had been at uh, in they had been in at the learning stage. It has been shown that when asked to recall autobiographical events from earlier in your lives, people in a sad or depressed mood tend to recall a disproportionate number of sad events whereas people in a happy mood recalled more of their happy experiences. This phenomenon is more accurately referred to as mood-congruent memory rather than mood-dependent memory, since the participant recalls items which are consistent with their present depressed mood, but which are not actually shown to have been present during the previous depressed phase. Tolving has made a distinction between episodic memory, which is our memory for the events and episodes in our own lives, and semantic memory, which is essentially our general knowledge store. The most obvious difference between these two memory systems is that episodic memory involves a retrieval of a personal experience associated with a particular context, for example, the place and time when it occurred, whereas semantic memory involves the retrieval of facts and information, such as the meaning of words, which are not attached to any particular context. Uh. 
The distinction between semantic and episodic memory receives strong support from the finding uh, that most organic amnesic uh, patients are severely impaired in their ability to recall specific episodes and events, while uh, showing little impairment in their ability to recall semantic knowledge. There are also patients who have a severely impaired semantic memory, but with a relatively intact episodic memory. Brain imaging studies have provided tentative evidence that episodic and semantic memories make use of some different brain areas, but also share some areas of brain activation. The retrieval of semantic knowledge produces activation in the left prefrontal cortex. The retrieval of episodic memories also produces activation of the left prefrontal cortex, but there is also activation of the medial temporal lobe including the hippocampus. The brain systems underlying episodic and semantic memory retrieval do seem to overlap considerably, so they may possibly share a common underlying storage system with the hippocampus being used for contextual associations. Addis and Schachter in 2012 found that the pattern of activation of the hippocampus during episodic retrieval was repeated when participants were asked to imagine future events. This suggests that the hippocampus may be involved in all forms of episodic memory, which involve mental time travel, including representations of both past and future events. Another story distinguishing between two memory systems is that of Mandler in 1980, who pointed out that recognition involves two different retrieval processes. The first is a judgment of familiarity, which simply involves deciding whether or not an item has ever been encountered before. The second is the recollection of when and where the item was encountered. In other words, the retrieval of context. Mandler's main of evidence for making this distinction was the observation that we can find someone's face familiar and yet be unable to recall the context in which we have met them. This is actually a common experience in everyday life. If you happen to meet your local butcher on the bus, you may find that although his face is familiar, you cannot remember who he is or where you have met him. This type of experience has actually come to be known as the butcher on the bus phenomenon, and it shows that it is possible to experience a feeling of familiarity even when we cannot achieve context recollection. Really kind of interesting. I met my dentist um, at the gym the other day. I was, I was uh, uh, dressing after, uh, after exercising, and he was, and he kept looking at me as if wait a minute, where do I know this guy? Where do I know this guy? And I started kind of talking to him. It didn't make any difference. He never did recognize me. I recognized him because he has a very fairly distinctive face. Uh, and it's possible that uh, since uh, we've been in, under uh, COVID protocols for, I don't know, uh, a couple of years, uh, that he doesn't remember what I look like. So it was really kind of interesting that he would know who I was in the context of working uh, at, the, uh, at the dentist's office, but he couldn't recognize me at the gym. Mandler suggests that familiarity and recollection probably operate as two independent retrieval routes, which may either be used separately or in combination. The main distinction between familiarity and recollection is that recollection requires the uh, effortful retrieval of context, whereas familiarity does not. Mandler in 1980 pointed out that a familiarity judgment is an automatic process, process which occurs without any conscious effort or intention. Recollection, on the other hand, is a controlled process which requires conscious attention, effort, and volition. Brain imaging studies suggest that recollection involves activation of the medial temporal lobes and hippocampus, whereas familiarity judgments are associated with activation of the perirenal uh, cortex. Uh, the finding that familiarity and recollection appear to uh, activate 
different brain areas adds support to the view that uh, they involve separate retrieval processes. Eichenbaum in 2015 suggests that familiarity information travels along the ventral stream, the what pathway, to the perirenal uh, cortex, uh, while contextual information follows the dorsal stream, the where pathway, to the parahippocampal cortex. These two neural streams then converge and meet at the medial temporal lobes, where their, uh, their input become bound together. Most tests of memory involve the direct testing of what the participant is able to consciously remember and report, which is known as explicit memory. Tests of recall and recognition are both examples of explicit memory, and for many years this was the only type of memory to be studied. More recently, there has been an increasing interest in the use of indirect memory tests, which detect implicit memory, which means memories for which the individual has no conscious awareness. Although such memories cannot be deliberately and consciously retrieved, their existence is implied by the behavior of the individual, hence the term implicit memory, because it affects their performance on certain tasks. Schott et al. in 2005 used an, a functional MRI study to compare the effects of implicit and explicit memory retrieval. They found that the retrieval of explicit memories caused increased activation of the left and right parietal and temporal lobes, whereas the retrieval of implicit memories caused reduced activation in the frontal and occipital lobes and in the left fusiform gyrus. They attributed this reduction in brain activation to the fact that implicit memory is probably far easier to retrieve than explicit memory and thus requires less cortical activation. Kim in 2019 uh, carried out a meta-analysis of functional MRI studies which confirmed that the implicit and explicit retrieval each activated different regions of the cortex. They found that the encoding of implicit and explicit memory involved activity in the same cortical region, uh, suggesting that these two systems probably depend on the, the same memory system for their encoding, but not for their retrieval. Bjork and Bjork make a distinction between the storage strength and the retrieval strength of a memory. Storage strength depends on how well the item has been learned and is fairly unchanging, whereas retrieval strength reflects the accessibility of the trace, which varies from moment to moment. The retrieval strength of an item is increased by retrieval and it is weakened by disuse. Bjork and Bjork argue that the act of retrieval is in itself a learning event which makes the retrieved item easier to retrieve in the future. Oops, I think I went the wrong direction. It has been discovered that retrieving a memory trace not only strengthens that trace, it also apparently inhibits the retrieval of rival memory traces. This phenomenon is known as retrieval-induced forgetting, or RIF. This raises the intriguing hypothesis that RAF could be the mechanism which causes the forgetting of disused memories over time. It would be very helpful to have memory a memory mechanism which activated the most recent memory of parking your car while inhibiting the memories of all previous occasions of uh, your car stopping. I forget where I was. <clears throat> the
This raises the intriguing hypothesis uh, that RAF could be the mechanism which causes the forgetting of disused memories over time. It would be very helpful to have a memory mechanism which activated the most recent memory by parking your car while inhibiting the memories of all previous occasions of parking your car. And of course, this is us. We, we are a garbage, uh, a wastebasket head, and we can just dump the wastebasket. That's getting rid of all your old memories. Victims of severe traumatic events who suffer from PTSD experience distressing intrusive memories which can persist for many years. Anderson in 2001 suggests that these distressing memories may be strengthened by repeated retrieval, whilst other more pleasant memories are inhibited by RIF. Some neuroses involve unwanted memories which may trigger a phobic response or an anxiety attack. Lang et al. in 1999 argue, in uh, uh, accordance with RIF research, that the new theory of disuse, that phobic responses may be strengthened by repeated retrieval, while the other less distressed memory responses to the same stimulus are inhibited. Uh, Lang et al. suggests that phobic patients might benefit from, the pra from practicing the retrieval of alternative non-fearful responses to the stimulus in order to inhibit the phobic response. Several studies have shown that RIF scores are impaired in those suffering from depression and anxiety. Highly anxious individuals have been found to have reduced RAF scores, and patients with generalized anxiety disorder show impaired RIF for threat-related information. These findings are consistent with the predictions of, of the attentional control theory by Isink et al. in 2007, which suggests that anxiety impairs the operation of inhibitory cognitive mechanisms. In recent years, researchers have made some interesting discoveries about the possibility of changing stored memories. Several studies have suggested that when an old memory is reactivated, it becomes vulnerable to change. This means that the retrieval of a stored memory represents an opportunity to make that memory uh, stronger or weaker before it is put back into storage. This phenomenon is known as reconsolidation, as it implies that a retrieved memory will be stored again, possibly in modified form. Uh, Q overload, Eberhard suggested that retrieval failure can occur when a particular retrieval cue has become associated with a number of different memory traces, making it more difficult to select the required trace. Q overload theory is essentially a uh, type of interference theory since memory failure arises from the presence of competing memory traces. Repression, Freud in 1914, famously suggested that we tend to repress memories that we find distressing, push, pushing them into the unconscious where they can no longer be consciously recalled. Freud argued that repressed memories could still cause anxiety and neuroses unless they could be brought back into the conscious awareness by means of psychoanalysis. The existence of repression as a cause of forgetting remains controversial, and there is no convincing evidence that it actually occurs. Consolidation failure. Milner reported that organic amnesics uh, were unable to convert temporary short-term memories into more solid and lasting long-term memory traces. This process is known as consolidation, and without it, memories will only survive for a few seconds. Consolidation failure occurs in normal individuals, too, if they fail to attend to the input and process it properly. There is also evidence for the occurrence of a more gradual form of consolidation, which continues to strengthen the memory trace for several years. It is known as system consolidation, and it can suffer impairment in amnesics and may cause forgetting in normal individuals, too. Inhibition, Anderson et al. in 1994 suggested that there are, are inhibitory mechanisms at work in the brain. 
which suppress unwanted memories in order to facilitate the selective retrieval of required memories. There is some evidence that such inhibition may be responsible for retrieval-induced forgetting and, and directed uh, forgetting. A few individuals have been studied who can uh, recall virtually everything they have ever experienced and who do not seem to experience normal forgetting. This is known as highly superior autobiographical memory, or HSAM, and causes problems for these individuals. Remembering every memory from your entire lifetime causes a state of mental overload. And with so many, so many memories competing for their attention, they are unable to focus on any uh, one specific memory. HSAM sufferers tend to be confused and highly stressed people. And surprisingly, their performance on memory tests is no better than average. Their difficulties in uh, coping with a near-perfect memory suggest that it is actually useful to be able to forget. And I'm trying to think of what her name is. She has highly superior autobiographical memory. Uh, Nardo. She was Nardo in Taxi. Uh, Mary Lou Henner. That's who that is. Mary Louise Henner. She has highly superior autobiographical memory. And she is an actress. Ruben et al. in 1998 found that most people tend to recall more autobiographical information from recent years than from the distant past. One exception was that older people recall an increased amount from their early adult years, a phenomenon known as the reminiscence bump. Ruben et al. found that people in their 70s tend to recall a particularly large number of events from the period when they were aged 10 to 30. And this is it right here. The reminiscence bump. A possible explanation for the reminiscence bump is that your our earlier years tend to be more eventful. And Bernstein, uh, Bernstein and Rubin in 2004 confirmed that the reminiscence bump does indeed peak at a time in life when important uh, events are taking place. Young adulthood is a period in life when an individual is often experiencing some things uh, for the very first time, and people often have vivid memories for their uh, first trip abroad or their first date. Subsequent dates and trips abroad tend to lose their novelty value and thus become less memorable. Gluck and Bluck in 2007 showed that the reminiscence bump applies mainly to positive and happy memories. Since older people tend to enjoy remembering happy events from their younger days, it is likely that the retrieval routes to those happy memories are strengthened by frequent retrieval. Jensen et al. in 2012 asked people to choose their favorite footballers of all time. Footballers, in this case, they were talking about soccer players. They found that most people cho chose players who were at their peak when the person choosing them was in their late teens rather than picking more recent players. Similarly, when older people were asked to name their favorite pieces of popular music, they tend to pick music from their teens and earlier adult years. And, of course, I put, this is Maradona. He's, he has since died of a heart attack, but uh, he was a uh, famous soccer player from the 1980s. This is him when he was really, really young. <clears throat> Most people remember very little from their early childhood, and studies have confirmed that people actually remember nothing at all from the first two or three years of their lives. This phenomenon is known as infantile amnesia. One possible explanation for infantile amnesia is that the brain may not have completed its physical development in early infancy and is not yet able to store memories. It has been found that the hippocampus, the brain area which is most important for memory storage, takes several years to become fully developed. Language skills also take some, some years to develop during infancy. Simcock and Hain in 2003 
showed that young people perform very poorly on memory tests requiring verbalization, but they do uh, better on nonverbal tests. The first study of flashbulb memory was carried out by Brown and Kulik in 1977, who decided to test out the widely held belief that all Americans could remember what they were doing when they heard the news of President Kennedy's assassination. Brown and Kulik found that all but one of their 80 participants were indeed able to report some details of their circumstances and surroundings when they heard the news of Kennedy's death, despite the passage of 14 years since that event. He was assassinated in 1963, November 22nd, 1963. Uh, and I do remember where I was in, on November 22nd, 1963. I was in English class. It was sixth period, um, and um, our English teacher was a Democrat, um, So, and she was also a librarian. Uh, so we were in English class, and somehow she found out that it had happened, and so she turned, uh, turned the radio on, and this was, um, this was in 1963. We had a basketball game that night. Of course, I'm from Indiana. Basketball is very important. We were all dressed up for a uh, pep rally. Uh, and we went to the prep pep rally, and we went to the game. But we had a game the next night, and it was canceled. So, But we, we had our game that night. Uh, what else happened? Um, I was uh, trapping. I was trapping, uh, so I made my rounds. Uh, uh, and looked at all my traps. Um, I remember doing that. And I remember my uh, uh, my trapping partner, uh, who was in the same grade that I was. I think we were, that was the eighth grade. Uh, my trapping partner um, kept saying that the Russians had, had assassinated Kennedy. Or the Cubans, I can't remember. Anyway. Uh, similar findings have been reported for a range of other major events, including the explosion of Space Shuttle Challenger, the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. Um, the Space Shuttle Challenger, I was drawing blood uh, in the pediatrics wing of, uh, of our hospital, uh, the outpatient uh, wing. Uh, I was working as a phlebotomist at Children's Hospital in, uh, in Omaha. And uh, I was downstairs drawing blood when the, uh, when the thing, uh, when it took off. And for some reason, it was on all the channels, and it blew up. And everybody just kind of gasped. Uh, but, of course, I had to draw. I was drawing blood at the time, so uh, I couldn't. <laughs> the terror stack on the World Trade Center, um, I, was, I had just finished teaching, and I was walking outside. I didn't know anybody at this school. I was brand new at, uh, at uh, Fort Belknap College. And uh, the uh, maintenance guy came up, and, uh, came up to me and told me he knew that I was military. So uh, he thought that uh, this meant that everybody was going to be called up again. Of course, I, that was, not, that was 20, uh, 2001. And um, uh, 2001, I was, well, how old was I? I was in my 50s, I think. Yeah, I was 52, so I was a little bit old, long in the tooth to be called back to uh, military service. PTSD is a disorder uh, which can occur after exposure to highly distressing or terrifying experience, such as natural disaster, warfare, traffic accident, or either physical or sexual violence. It is mainly characterized by intrusive memories and flashbacks, vivid and distressing memories, of the initial trauma, and other memory-related symptoms such as nightmares, pain, nausea, sweating, and trim or trembling. Involuntary activation of these trauma-related memories occurs when PTSD patients are exposed to sensory triggers such as sights or sounds which remind them of the experience. Uh, I have uh, uh, PTSD to some tiny extent. Uh, anytime I smell mutton, uh, I get, I start having interesting flashbacks, but uh, uh, we won't go into that.
you guys eat mutton all the time. It has been estimated that around 30% of trauma-exposed individuals will go on to develop PTSD, and of these, 40% will have long-lasting symptoms. What causes PTSD to occur in some people but not in others is a fundamental question for cognitive psychologists. One possible explanation is that it may depend on whether or not the individual interprets the trauma symptoms as having a significant impact on their life. And obviously, I'm not around, I hadn't been around mutton for a really long time. And then when I came to, to uh, Diné College, uh, they started cooking it uh, in, the, uh, in the cafeteria. And uh, I noticed... I noticed uh, that, that uh, I tried to stay away from the cafeteria a lot because of the smell of mutton. The dual representation theory uh, proposes that traumatic memories can be either held as verbally accessible episodic memories, which can be retrieved uh, deliberately, or as situationally accessible memories, which are automatically triggered by particular cues. This theory argues that in PTSD, the automatic retrieval of situational accessible memories is strengthened, whereas the retrieval of verbally accessible episodic memories is weakened. This leads to intrusive and voluntary retrieval of distressing images and emotional responses, which are largely separated from the episodic memories of the same events. This fragmentation of memory makes it difficult to process the memory adequately as the distressing images are not under con uh, conscious control and are disconnected from the context of the stressful event. Dual representation theory offers a possible explanation for the fact that PTSD is so hard to treat since it proposes that sensory memories can only be accessed when some aspect of the initial traumatic situation automatically cues their activation. A war veteran with PTSD is likely to have symptoms which are associated with sensory cues, such as the sound of gunfire or a helicopter rotor, whereas attempts to treat the disorder are usually based on deliberate attempts to access the memories consciously and verbally, for example, being asked by a therapist to describe one's experiences. The therapy is therefore accessing a different type of memory to the one that is causing the problem, so it will be less effective in dealing with intrusive memory itself. Uh, I have a problem with the um, uh, helicopter rotor blades, uh, not, the <laughs> not that kind of trouble, but when I hear them, it, it, uh, it gives me the whim whims. Uh, so the, my only two uh, responses to, uh, to uh, whatever trauma I uh, lived through uh, was uh, the, the sound of rotor blades and the smell of mutton, as weird as that is. And I've, I've never had any other, um, anything else cause a, a uh, flashback. The dual representation theory is supported by neuroimaging evidence, which shows that flashbacks are associated with increased activation in sensory and motor areas of the brain, but de decreased activation of the regions involved in conscious memory retrieval. It has also been shown that negative or stressful input produces, reduces the association binding and uh, associated binding and overall coherence of a memory in both PTSD sufferers and healthy individuals. One factor which may contribute to an individual's susceptibility to PTSD is the extent to which they are able to inhibit intrusive memories. This was investigated by Caterino et al. in 2015, who compared a group of PTSD patients with a control group of trauma-exposed individuals with no current or historical PTSD symptoms. Their results indicated that PTSD patients performed significantly worse in regulating inhibition of their thoughts compared to the control group. And the reality is that I can't control control smells. Well, I can't I can't really control either one. Uh, I can't control the sounds of rotors, the helicopters flying over. Uh, I first noticed this. I was working at a hospital in Omaha, and um, uh, I was coming into work about four o'clock in the morning and uh, a life flight was going off or was taking off and that's it's really it's the darkness um, and the uh, sound of the rotor blades 
And the next thing that happened, I had to get in the, the uh, elevator and go up to the seventh floor. And it was the darkness, the rotor blades, and the feeling of not having any control and going up, uh, which is the feeling you get when you fly in a helicopter, pretty much. So those three things kind of kind of threw me for a for a loop uh, at that at that time. Um, since since then, uh, rotor blades. Just hearing rotor blades, I can I can hear them from. I'm like radar. I can I can detect uh, uh, helicopters uh, when they're when they're miles away. It's it's weird. Uh, but when I hear helicopter blades, I I get uh, like I said, I get the whim whams. Uh, the most effective form of treatment for PTSD is trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, which encourages reprocessing of the emotional content of the trauma memory to integrate new corrective information. And of course, this is the way we, that we treat uh, we tr we treat PTSD is by having them remember the the uh, uh, traumatic event over and over and over again, and but replacing. Of course, they we have them remember it in a uh, in a safe environment, and because of that, it it uh, lessens the impact of uh, of the uh, of the traumatic event. This approach has been shown to be effective for survivors of terror attacks, violent assault, sexual abuse, and displacement. Although this is the most effective type of therapy currently available for PTSD, it is only effective in about two thirds of patients. I was in a terrorist attack when I was in Germany. Uh, we, uh, the USAFE headquarters was was blown up uh, by a terrorist group called uh, the Biter Meinhof Gang. You can look them up if you like. <laughs> anyway, they blew they blew up. I, I I didn't. It wasn't that traumatic for me. I was one of the first medics on the scene, so that. But you know, it was just staunching blood pretty much. I, I heard the explosion, but I didn't. I didn't really realize what was going on until, until uh, I went past the uh, building and there were, all the windows were blown out. All the cars were flat. It's really kind of interesting. A courtroom is one place where memory can be a crucial importance, be of crucial importance as a testimony given by an eyewitness frequently provides the decisive evidence which determines whether the defendant is convicted or not. It has been shown that eyewitness testimony is the most important single factor influencing the outcome of criminal cases. This is a great deal uh, of, there is a great deal of evidence to suggest that eyewitness testimony is, only unre is often unreliable and does not justify the faith placed in it by the courts. The introduction of DNA testing has revealed that many people have been convicted of crimes which they did not commit. So far, no less than 360 Americans convicted of serious crimes have sub subsequently been freed as a result of DNA testing. And this is due to the Innocence Project. And some of these individuals were on death row awaiting execution when it occurred. More than 70% of these individuals have been convicted on the basis of eyewitness testimony, which was evidently mistaken in all these cases. It is clear that eyewitness testimony is not always reliable, and inaccurate testimony can have tragic consequences for those who are wrongly convicted. Pioneering work by Bartlett in 1932 demonstrated that recall is prone to distortion, by an individual's prior knowledge and schemas. Research on eyewitness testimony has confirmed that eyewitnesses are indeed susceptible to reconstructive errors based on previous knowledge uh, and expectations. Uh, it has been found that eyewitness testimony is also prone to contamination from information required, uh, acquired after the event, a phenomenon known as the misinformation effect. This effect was first demonstrated by Loftus and Palmer in 1974, who showed their, showed their participants a film of a car accident. When the participants were later asked to estimate how fast the cars had been traveling, their responses were found to be very significantly, to vary significantly according to how the question was worded. 
And this is a three car collision. He got T boned by two different cars. Uh, and balloons came out of this truck. <laughs> as weird as that is. Post event contamination is now known to be an important influence on eyewitness testimony in real life uh, criminal cases. Cross witness uh, contamination has been demonstrated in a laboratory experiment designed to simulate the aspects of the McVeigh, Oklahoma City bombing case. And it was found that witnesses were particularly likely to change their description of a crime after dis discussing it with another witness who expressed great confidence in what they had seen. I don't know if you remember when Timothy McVeigh blew up the uh, Murrah building, uh, the federal building in Oklahoma City. Uh, I had, uh, how did that work? We were in Oklahoma, living in the Oklahoma City area uh, from 1990 until 1994. 1994, 1995, we went to Japan and we came back uh, in the spring. Uh, and the Murrah building was blown up in, on April 12th, 1995. Okay, and we came back to Mississippi. So uh, we knew, uh, the strange part was, uh, of course, I worked uh, in medicine in, uh, in Oklahoma City. So I knew almost all the people we were seeing on television. Uh, not the ones that were killed, of course, but the medics and the doctors that were running around and taking care of people. We knew all those guys. <clears throat> it has been found that the that child witnesses are generally more prone to suggestion and memory distortion than adults. Elderly people also tend to be fairly unreliable witnesses, despite showing more confidence than younger witnesses in the accuracy of their memories. Among the younger adult population, individuals with lower intelligence and low working memory capacity are more vulnerable to misinformation and false memories. Like other forms of memory, eyewitness testimony becomes weaker and more fragmented with the passage of time, and consequentially, it becomes more vulnerable to contamination from other sources. It is therefore important that police interview the witness immediately after the witness uh, event. It is this, if this is not possible, the witness can be given a self-administered questionnaire to record their observations before any further contamination occurs. There are important lessons to be learned from these studies. Judges and juries should realize that witnesses cannot be expected to have infallible memories, and they should not place too much reliance on the evidence of eyewitness testimony alone. Statements should be taken from, from witnesses as soon as possible after the event, and witnesses should be allowed to use notes when giving their evidence in court at, at a later date. Police interviewers should avoid the use of leading questions or suggestions which could implant misinformation in the witness's head. The interviewing of eyewitnesses has been in extensive use of the findings of cognitive research. In particular, uh, the uh, principle of context-dependent memory has been found to be of value to police interviewers who use context cues to jog the memories of witnesses. One way of achieving this is by creating a crime reconstruction in which the original events and context of the crime are replicated as closely as possible. Actors play out the roles of, of the people involved in the crime, sometimes in the setting where the actual crime took place. Such reconstructions are often shown on television in the hope that witnesses may be reminded of some relevant piece of information. In the cognitive interview uh, introduced by Geiselman et al. in 1985, the witness is simply questioned about the, the actual crime. The witness undergoing a cognitive interview is encouraged to recall all aspects of, crime, of the crime scene, including contextual details. The witness may be asked to recall what clothes they were wearing, what the weather was like, and even the newspaper headlines on that day. They may uh, be shown photographs of the crime scene, or they may actually be taken back to it. 
Uh, there, may, there may also be an attempt to recreate their mental state during the event by asking them to try to remember how they felt at the time. The cognitive interview uh, thus increases the amount of context reinstatement, uh, which increases the range of possible retrieval cues and retrieval routes. Geiselman et al. in 1985 confirmed that the cognitive interview does uh, normally elicit more information from the witness than does the traditional police interview. In addition to the basic principle of context re uh, reinstatement, an additional technique used, uh, used in the cognitive interviews is to, to instruct the witness to report everything, regardless of how trivial or irrelevant things might seem. Studies have confirmed that both the context reinstatement and the, uh, the report everything techniques add to the effectiveness of the interview, and both have been found to be useful in police work. There is also evidence that the cognitive interview procedure can reduce the witness's susceptibility to misinformation effects and post-event contamination. Many subsequent studies have confirmed the effectiveness of cognitive interviews in uh, both laboratory and real-life police investigations. In a review of 42 cognitive interviews studies, uh, uh, Konkin et al. in 1999 concluded that the cognitive interviews consistently elicited more items of correct information than a, a standard interview for both adult and child witnesses. Konkin uh, noted that the cognitive interviews also elicits more incorrect information. While this needs to be borne in mind by police officers making use of the cognitive interview procedure, the effects of these errors on overall retrieval is usually quite trivial. One limitation of the cognitive interview procedure is that it becomes less effective when very long retention intervals are involved. Police officers do not always have the time to interview all available witnesses directly after a crime, so a self-administered booklet version of the cognitive interview has been developed which can be handed to witnesses when interviewers are not available. The reason I have this picture is because this is from the 1930s, something that happened in the 1930s. Another problem with the cognitive interview is that it is not very suitable for use on very small children who often have difficulty understanding the instructions. The cognitive interview has been found to be reasonably effective for children aged eight years and above. It has also been found that asking the witness to draw a sketch of the crime scene can help to provide contextual cues, and this is especially useful with small children and elderly witnesses. And that is the end of the chapter. So there you go. Uh, kind of an interesting one. At least we got to talk about PTSD and cognitive interviews. So I'll see you next week, I think. I'm pretty sure and we'll tackle chapter seven.